Amen. I want to thank you once again for being here tonight. I want to encourage you to open your Bibles this evening to Mark. We're going to be in Mark again, so please open your Bibles to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. Tonight we are going to deal with what I'm calling Jesus and his dark night. Jesus and his dark night. Matthew chapter 14. I'm sorry, Mark chapter 14. Thank you for my checker, my fact checkers out there. <laughs> Mark chapter 14, verse 32. Please hear the word of God. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter, James, and John, and he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and he prayed, If it were possible that the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and he found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he again went away and prayed, saying the same words. And he again found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came a third time, and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See my betrayer is at hand. Father in heaven, we pray. Father, even now that you would give us a glimpse into the agony of Christ. The agony that he experienced, experienced here in the Garden of Gethsemane. Help us to see his suffering. To be touched by his suffering. To the point that we are never the same. Lord, I have been praying, and I pray that you would stir us up to greater works, that you would save the lost, and I pray that we would be faithful to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'm going to try to be as transparent with you as I can tonight. I'm going to share something with you that only very few of you even know about in this church. And the only reason some people know about it is because I told them. If I didn't tell them, they wouldn't have known. I've, I, there's, there have been some folks in our second service. You do know that our second service is a little bit younger than our first service, right? Nobody has said this to me in the first service. Nobody. And it's because I think you understand. The older folks in the first service. This may say something about me. I may wish I didn't tell this story. But the second service, I had several people ask me the same question. I had some people come to me and they said, Pastor, we've noticed a change in you. We've noticed a difference in you. I don't know what it is, but there's something different and I'm just concerned about you. Well, I appreciate that. What the younger generation don't know is what it's like to live in chronic pain. And so for three years of my life, I lived in chronic pain. And you didn't know anything about it because I didn't tell you. My wife knew about it. But for three years of chronic pain and then two major surgeries, that left me flat on my back for two months. Nobody in the first service ever said to me, Pastor, 
You're different. I think it's because they understand. But here's what I'm going to tell you. Is I'm better now. And you better watch out because I may splinter this pulpit before the night's over. Okay? But I'm fine. The old Blake is back. Okay? He, he's a little bit different, but he's back. Now, here's the reason I want to t- I'm telling you this story. Because there was something more significant than pain and surgery that happened to me during that time. I didn't know what it was. I felt so distant from God. I would cry out to God in prayer. I would search God in the scripture. And I just felt like he was distant. Like I couldn't get through to him. But all I knew to do was to just keep doing what I knew to do. I, all I knew to do was to keep doing what had got me to this point, and that was praying and fasting and seeking God. But I went into this state of what I'm referring to as spiritual depression, where spiritually I just felt so distant from the Lord. And as I was in that time, I, I began to realize through studying everything that I wasn't the only one who, who has gone through that. Spurgeon, Luther, Abraham, or uh, uh, William Cowper. I mean, the list goes on. Job, Jeremiah, even Jesus. And I begin to realize that for me, it's different for Jesus and others and Job, but for me, the reason I was in that position, I didn't realize it until later on, what it was and what God was doing, It was because through the sickness, I was doing the things I was supposed to do. But there was something that caused me to actually lose dependence upon God. Where I was going through the motions without true connection. It takes a lot for a pastor to be willing to own up to that. Now, I'm willing to own up to it because I'm on the other side of it. But... That is the reason for this book. This is my new book, A Christian Journey, Making Sense of Spiritual Depression. And so, um, I, I cover this story in this book. I look at Job, I look at Jesus, I look at others. And I explain what it is. And what God's doing and what he might be doing in your life if you feel the same way. But as we look at this passage of scripture, Jesus is in great distress and agony. It won't be long before Jesus is nailed to the cross and he cries out from the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me. Jesus is experiencing his own dark night of the soul. His own sense of spiritual depression in this passage of scripture. The Bible says that this took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane is by the Mount of Olives. It was a garden just outside of or is a garden just outside of Jerusalem. The word Gethsemane literally means olive press or the pressing of oils. And that's what they would do there. People would bring olives from all over the area, even olives there in the garden, and they would put them in a press and these olives would be ground down with pressure by the millstone in order to to, uh, produce this precious oil that comes from these olives. It's not by happenstance that Jesus Christ himself is in the Garden of Gethsemane, the place of pressure, the place of grinding, the place where the olives are pressed until the oil comes out. Can I say to you tonight that we would never have the oil of Christ's salvation If it were not first 
for his crushing. It was Isaiah the prophet who said, it was the will of the Lord to crush him and to put him to grief. We see the agony of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. There's three things I want to share with you tonight. I want to talk to you about the drama of that night, the agony of that night, and the lessons that we learn from that night. First of all, let's talk about the drama of that night. The the night began innocent enough. You'll recall that Jesus and his disciples are in the upper room, just just an innocent gathering. There they are, circled around the table. They, they've enjoyed a fellowship meal. Normal. Simple enough. But it was during that meal that Jesus Christ identified that one of them would betray him. We know that after the fellowship meal that Judas gets up and he leaves. And at that point, Jesus introduces the Passover. So not only was it a night that was innocent enough, but it was also a night of instruction. Jesus taught his disciples the true meaning of the bread and the wine. He spoke to them about how the bread represented his body that would be broken and how the wine represented his blood that would be shed. So it was a simple night. It was an instructive night. But it was also a night of intense prayer. And I'm not specifically talking about the prayer that Jesus prayed in the garden. As a matter of fact, here's how it plays out. Jesus and his disciples are in the upper room. They enjoy a fellowship meal. Jesus reveals that one would betray. He also reveals that Peter would deny. Judas leaves. The Passover is celebrated. Apart from Judas, Jesus explains the meaning of the bread and the wine. Then what does Jesus do next? Some would think, well, Jesus leaves the upper room and he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. That's not what he does next. The very next thing that Jesus does after celebrating the Passover with his disciple is to pray his high priestly prayer of John chapter 17. Jesus prayed, John 17, before he entered the garden of Gethsemane. And it was in that prayer that he prayed that we would be one. You remember that? Lord, I pray that they would be one as you and I are one, that the world may see that they are one and believe that you have sent me. And Jesus prays for the church that we would be one. It was also a night, as we talk about the drama of that night, it was also a night of betrayal. Betrayal through a kiss. It was a night of swords and clubs. A night that began, aren't you glad we're getting a new one of these? It was a night that began with a fellowship meal. But it was a night that ended with swords and clubs, betrayal, arrest, and a kangaroo court. The drama of that night. The suffering that Christ experienced was extreme. It was lingering. Jesus suffered at the hands of the Jews and the Gentiles. Jesus suffered the hands of men if this keeps going we're going to to do something different it's getting him it's messing with my preaching I had a check for four million dollars right quick (laughs) thank you brother all right Jesus suffered at the hands of the Jews and the Gentiles. He suffered at the hands of men and women. He suffered at the hands of magistrates, kings, princes, 
soldiers, and even suffered at the hands of common people. So the suffering of Christ is great. And we're going to look into that suffering just a little bit tonight. The Bible talks about the kings and the princes and the Jews and the Gentiles. And the Bible says this, that they stood and took counsel against the Lord and against his anointed. That's what we read in the Psalms. The psalmist tells us that they took counsel against Christ and against his anointed. Jesus, who is perfect, took upon our vile sin and suffered at the hands of vile people. Not only do I want to talk about the drama of that night, I want to talk about the agony of that night. The Bible says that they, took, they went to the place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter, James, and John, and he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. Notice that. The Bible says he was distressed and troubled. What do those words mean? It literally is a picture of someone who is gripped with terrifying horror. Now, it's hard for us to think about Christ that way. Why? Because often when we think about Christ, we focus upon, whether we want to admit it or not, when we think about Christ, what aspect of Christ do we usually focus on? I would suggest to you the deity of Christ. I would suggest to you that often when we think about Jesus, we think about Jesus being the eternal Son of God, and He is, and we Realize that Jesus Christ is God who came in the flesh. But what I want you to realize tonight, and it is the emphasis of this passage, that Christ was not only fully God, but Christ was also fully man. And in this passage, the emphasis is upon the humanity of Christ. So Christ in his full humanity is gripped by the horror and the terror of what he is about to experience. So much so that he asked three of his closest disciples to go with him. He said, Peter, think about this. Why did Jesus ask Peter, James, and John? Could it be that Christ did not want to be alone? He asked Peter, James, and John to go along with him. And the Bible says, upon arriving in the garden, before Jesus began to pray, he was troubled and distressed. Luke tells us, Luke records the same event, and Luke uses the word agony. That Christ himself was in agony. To the point that Christ literally sweat drops of blood. So as we talk about the agony of that night, it was, an, it was a night of great distress for Christ. Is it even medically possible for someone to sweat blood? Yes, it is. As a matter of fact, there's a name for it, and I've looked it up for you. Hematohydrosis. Hematohydrosis. Hydrosis. It's a rare condition and it's caused by extreme sufferings and extreme levels of stress. You'll be amazed. If you look at WebMD, they'll tell you how to, how to cure it. They'll tell you how to fix it. Here's what they say. They say, first of all, you need some beta blockers and some vitamin C. You need some antidepressants. And you need drugs that will help you to help stop your blood clotting. What did Jesus say? Pray. Pray. And so here's Jesus, gripped by the horror of the reality of what is coming his way. To the point that he is in agony. And that agony is not only spiritual, it's physical. As Christ sweats these drops of blood. And we 
read in John's account, John chapter 12, 27, that Jesus knew that his hour had come. He knew what he was about to endure. So as we talk about the agony of that night, it was a night of distress. Secondly, it was a night of intense sorrow. The agony of that night, not only was there distress, there was sorrow. As a matter of fact, when you read Mark, if you look at verse 34 again, and he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful. Well, how sorrowful was Christ? How much sorrow did he experience? Well, look at your Bible. My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. And now notice this. What does he say to Peter, James, and John? Stay with me. Stay with me. That wasn't just for them. It was for Christ. Christ says to those three disciples who are closest to him, would you stay with me? I'm sorrowful to death. I'm troubled and greatly distressed. The Hebrew, the author of Hebrews, as a matter of fact, I'm just going to turn there because it's such a powerful verse. But Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. We read these words of Christ. Well, maybe we will. All right, Hebrews 5 7. Look at the Word of God. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication. With loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. What does Hebrew say? That Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and what? And tears. This is our Lord. This is the one who is eternal. The very one who has always existed. The very one who spoke the world into existence. The very one whose heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. The very one who was surrounded by the praises of angels. The Bible says in Isaiah 6 that even the seraphim stood above him. And with six wings, with two they covered their face, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And when Isaiah saw a vision of the pre-incarnate Christ, the Bible says that he was so holy that Isaiah cried out, Woe is me, for I am ruined. That is the very glory of Christ. This is what Christ experienced before he took on flesh. But yet our God chose to humble himself and added full humanity to his already pre-existent deity. And there was nothing for him that was beneficial For him to take on flesh. It was for us that he took on flesh. It is for us that he is in distress. It is for us that he experienced sorrow. It is for us that the eternal God of heaven is in agony. It is for us that he sweat drops of blood. Isaiah said that his grief and sorrow was partly due to the fact that he was taking upon himself our our grief and our, our sorrow. So not only is it the grief and the sorrow of Christ in his humanity, but it's also our grief and our sorrow. I, I'll give you a minute to wrap your brain around that.
the sorrow and the grief that Christ is expressing, the agony and the distress is what was reserved for you and me because we sinned against God. And then Christ took that sorrow and took that distress and took that agony and he took it to the Garden of Gethsemane and he endured it on our behalf. Just like I told the man at the shake shop today. I said, aren't you glad that Jesus Christ took our sin upon himself so that we don't have to experience the agony of the cross or the agony of Gethsemane? Aren't you, aren't you happy about that, brother? It was in the agony of that night, the agony of distress, the agony of sorrow, and then the agony of loneliness. How can one who possesses the attribute of aseity, do you know what that is? You know what the, the, the aseity of God is? That means that God is in need of nothing. God is self-sufficient. There is nothing that God needs from us. But yet in his humiliation and taking upon humanity, Christ needs his disciples with him. He says, stay awake and what? Pray with me. And it's not just for me, it's for you that you do not enter into temptation. And as Jesus as Jesus walked just a few yards away, Jesus fell to his knees and then he fell to his face. And the disciples fell asleep. So the loneliness of Christ. He wanted his closest disciples to stay awake and pray with him, to watch with him, to comfort him. Those who had been with him from the beginning those who were privy to all of his miracles, those who saw his transfiguration. Yet, when he came to them, sleeping. Not just once, not just twice, but three times. He desired fellowship. He desired comfort. And he found none. The psalmist foretold this. Psalms 69 verse 20 says, Reproaches have broken my heart so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, but there was none. That is the very words of Christ, beloved, in the Old Testament. Speaking of this event, Christ prophesying in the Old Testament this through the psalmist, Reproaches, he says, they've come upon me. My heart is in despair. I looked for pity, he said, and there was none. And so we see there's so much to the agony of that night. Distress, sorrow, loneliness. Agony both spiritually, knowing that he would be separated from the Father, knowing that he would drink the cup of the Father's wrath, knowing that there would be a divine separation, Christ suffered spiritually. Not only knowing that, but he who knew no sin became sin. The very thing he hated, he became. Think about the purity of Christ taking upon that which is vile. And then volitionally, freely, willingly suffer at the hands of those who are vile. And then the loneliness. Also characterized by the agony of that night was the agony of sin's consequence. What is sin's consequence? Darkness. Darkness. 
How did the ministry, how did Jesus' public ministry begin, beloved? Was Christ not baptized? And then after his baptism, carried into the wilderness? And while he was in the wilderness, what happened? He was tempted by Satan himself. So Satan tempted Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. I have a question for you. Even though it is not clearly stated in this passage, I will acknowledge. However, I would assume that if Christ were tempted by Satan at the beginning of his ministry, that he too was tempted by Satan at the end of his ministry. So there's something happening in this passage that we have to look beyond the text to see, and that is the temptation of the enemy of coming against the Son of God. He is an enemy lurking, seeking whom he may devour. Surely, all the way up to the cross, perhaps Satan was doing everything that he can, either to cause Christ to go to the cross, thinking that that would end Christ, or keeping Christ from going to the cross. Yet Christ humbled himself to allow a creature he created to tempt him. And then there's the consequence of sin. And I think that this is what contributed to his distress and his agony and his sorrow. Think about this. That all the sins of all humanity from the fall of Adam till, now, till, till then, until now, Let me say it again. All the sins of all humanity since the fall of Adam were imputed to Christ. All the sins of all humanity since the fall of Adam, every sin of every kind, of every perversion, was imputed to Christ. So there's sin's imputation. There's Satan's temptation. And then, I have not even mentioned the cup. Jesus said, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Jesus foresaw the betrayal of Judas. He foresaw the denial of Peter. He foresaw the hatred of the Jews. Yet the greatest thing on his mind was the cup. So the question is, what does the cup represent? Well, Isaiah 51 verse 17 helps us. And this is what the prophet says. Wake up, wake up, O Jerusalem. You have drunk the cup of the Lord's fury. Ah, you have drunk the cup of the Lord's fury. You have drunk the cup of terror. Tipping out its last drop. So what was the cup that Christ drunk? What was the cup that Christ was referring to? When he said, Father, there's any other way, let this cup Pass from me. We learn that it is none other than the fury, the cup of God's fury, the cup of God's terror, the cup of God's wrath. By going to the cross, Christ would drink the full cup of God's righteous indignation against sin. He would drink it all the way to the bottom. He would drain it until nothing was left. He would bear the judgment that rightly falls upon Israel and he would bear the judgment that rightly falls upon all of humanity which includes you and me. In this process his suffering would be horrible lingering and extreme. 
But it's important for us to realize at this point, as extreme as the suffering was in the garden, it was not the most extreme of Christ's suffering. That is still yet to come. John Flavel, prominent Puritan, said, He suffered in his soul. Yea, the sufferings of his soul were the very soul of his sufferings. He felt in his inner man the uh, the torments and inexpressible anguish of the wrath of God. Jonathan Edwards, I read a, a parcel of his sermon, and he said, this was Christ's principal purpose. What? To come in order to drink the cup of the Father's wrath, to be our propitiation for sin. What are the lessons that we learn from that night? What are the lessons we learn? Well, there's several things. We learn of Christ. We learn the dread of his suffering. We see that here, that even Christ himself in his humanity dreaded the suffering. We also see the humility of Christ in this passage. That he would take on humanity and physically suffer as he did. We also see the need of the hour in this passage. And what is that? That we pray. That we stay awake and we do what? We pray. We also see the love of Christ in this passage. That Christ would love us so much. He would love sinners to such a degree that he would go through such spiritual depression, that he would go through such a dark night, that he would go through sorrow and distress and agony. But what about you and me? What's in this for us? When Christ was buried, and when Christ rose from the dead, he rose from the dead both bodily and spiritually. So Jesus Christ, his resurrection from the dead was a bodily resurrection. A bodily resurrection. He bodily rose from the dead. Which means that when Christ rose from the dead, he rose what? Fully God and fully man. And when Christ ascended into heaven, how did he ascend? Fully God, fully man. Jesus right now mediates in heaven on our behalf as fully God and fully man. One day Jesus is coming back and he's coming back fully God and fully man. Now, why am I emphasizing that? Because I want you to remember that Christ is still fully man. So when he comes to you, and he says, stay awake and pray with me, what does he find you doing? C.S. Lewis, I believe, pictured this the best. In his infamous book and the lion, the, or famous book, I should say, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. We know that it's, a movie was made about that and, and that there is such a gospel message that is expressed through, that, through the book and through the program. Here's how it goes. The great lion, Aslan, there's a scene where he has offered his life in exchange for the petulant schoolboy Edmund. 
You get quite aggravated with Edmund when you watch the show. Why? Because he betrayed even his own siblings. On the night before Aslan, the lion, the night before he is to be slain at the stone table, the two girls, Lucy and Susan, follow behind him closely, watching him, longing to comfort him. Lucy and Susan know where Aslan is going. Filled with sadness, the lion allows the children to accompany him for a while. Jesus, Peter, James, and John. Forward they went again, and one of the girls walked on each side of Aslan. Or, and, and they walked slowly. Why? Because Aslan was walking slowly. And as he walked to his place of death, his great royal head dropped. His nose nearly touched the grass. And then he stumbled. And he gave a low moan. <clears throat> Do we not see Christ falling to his knees in the Garden of Gethsemane and falling to his face? Aslan, dear Aslan, said Lucy. What's wrong? Can't you tell us? Are you ill, dear Aslan, asked Susan. No, said Aslan. I'm sad. And I'm lonely. Lay your hands on my mane so that I can feel that you are there. And let us walk together. And so the girls did what they had longed to do ever since they first saw him. They buried their, their cold hands in the dark, beautiful sea of fur of Aslan's mane. And they walked with him. The Messiah went to the olive press. To be squeezed under the great stone of the world's sin. He went to unravel the fundamental error in the human heart. And in the stage of descent, he fell on his face in agony. Upon the realization of the horror and the terror that he would experience. He knew that his father would be repulsed by sin and Christ had taken sin upon himself. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, the place of crushing, Jesus passed through death and hell that we might safely pass over to heaven. So let me ask you a question. What can we do for him? What can we do for him? There's one sense where we can do nothing. He has the attribute of a saiety. He needs nothing from us. There, there's a sense where we can do nothing for him because salvation is his sovereign work and only Jesus can save. But in another sense, Everything. What is it that Jesus wants from you? No different than what he wanted from Peter, James, and John this night. He wants you to stay with him. Walk with him. Pray with him. Serve with him. He wants you to anoint him with your tears as you pray to him. He wants you to abide in him. 
So, beloved, as we look at Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, as we look at Christ in that place of crushing, as we look at the drama of that night, the agony of that night, and as we learn the lessons of that night, what are they? That we abide in Him and that we love Him and that we walk with Him and that we serve Him. So, so, are we asleep? Or are we awake? What did Paul say to the church in Rome? Wake up, O sleeper. Wake up, O sleeper. I've already decided my next book. You know when I decided it? How long have I been preaching? One hour? You do know I'm not worried about that, right? So... About an hour ago, as we were singing, I want to say we were worshiping, but I'm not too sure. Not anything to do with the platform. It's just, sometimes I wonder if we actually worship or do we just sing? How about you? You. And I don't know. That's a question you got to answer. But the title of my next book is going to be The Biblical Posture of Worship. I'm serious. What does the Bible say about worship? What is the posture of worship in the Bible? And what did it look like when people actually worshipped God? Because I'm going to tell you, I think when we sing a song, and I'm helping my, my music pastors out. Listen, worship pastors, listen. When we sing a song, and we say this is what heaven sounds like, by golly, You ought to be singing to the top of your lungs that you almost give yourself a hernia. Listen. Because I'm going to tell you what heaven sounds like, and it don't sound like what it does in here sometimes. So here's my challenge. In light of the agony that Christ experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane, at least we can do when we sing to the God of heaven is change our posture. You can't go from picking your nose and worshiping God with the same body posture. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I might just keep you here to 830 to force you to worship God. Listen, folks, I don't know your heart. I really don't. But I'm telling you something. Something's got to change. Something's got to change. Something's got to change. Something's got to change in you and change in me. And I'm going to tell you what the issue is. Is that our view of the sovereign God of heaven is not high enough. When's the last time we caught a vision of the holiness of God to the point That all we could do is say, Lord, I can't sing. Not because I don't want to, but woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of glory. The very one who humbled himself to take upon flesh and go to the 
agony of the garden of Gethsemane so that I wouldn't have to experience the sorrow and the distress and the agony and the pain and the terror and the horror that Christ experienced so that I wouldn't have to experience the betrayal and the denial so that I wouldn't have to experience the scourging and the nails and the crown and the cross and so that I wouldn't have to experience the undiluted wrath of God Jesus did that act. Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. So let's do it. Amen. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's get after it. Let's share the gospel. Let's seek to win those who are lost to Christ. Let's be on mission with the Lord. Let's get on our faces and let's bite the carpet and cry out to holy God for revival and spiritual awakening. Let's ask God to get in us and stir us up so that we're never the same. So that this city knows that First Baptist Edmund exists on the corner of 33rd and Bryant. There's people in this city that haven't even heard of us. And there's people in this city that don't even know where we're located. And I'm telling you, we got to do something about it. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Don't you leave him and forsake him. Abide. Serve. Love. Be with him. Him so that he doesn't have to come look for you and find you sleeping. I'm going to ask if you would to bow your heads tonight. Surely it's impossible for anybody in this room to say no to Christ tonight. Surely that would be absolutely impossible after what you just heard. So are you saved? Because he wants you to be saved. He died for your salvation and rose again for your justification. Would you give your life to him tonight? Would you come and receive him as your Lord and Savior? Nobody loves you as much as Jesus does. He won't lie to you. He won't deceive you. He'll guide you. He'll lead you. Come to him. Come to him and be saved. Others of us, how about we just say, Lord, I need to be stirred up and I need to be kicked in the pants or whatever else that needs to be done oh God just set me on fire for you send the wind and the rain and the fire of your Holy Spirit and pour it into my heart so that I'm never the same let us never be the same there's so much more we can give to the Lord So much more love that we ought to be giving to Him. So many more prayers that we ought to be praying. Father God, we commit this time to You. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand and come as the Lord leads. Hey, we want to say thank you for checking us out on YouTube. Thank you for listening to the sermon. And if you have any questions about the content of that sermon or even about salvation... Uh, please contact us on the website that's listed there on the screen. We would love to hear from you, also be able to speak with you, and perhaps even answer any questions that you may have. God bless. Keep tuning in.